Um, good morning. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm pleased to call to order uh, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission meeting number 192. Chairman Crosby is on a conference uh, and has asked me to chair the meeting. And Commissioner uh, Stebbins will be with us uh, momentarily. He's en route. Um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes, I move that the uh, minutes of the of meeting 188. Mike, please. Microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. I move that the uh, minutes of um, public meeting number 188 uh, held April 26 to 28th of 2016 be approved subject to typographical errors and other known material matters being corrected. I had one um, issue that I'd like to raise with regard to the, with regard to the minutes. Um, on 10-11, uh, uh, I see that um, IEB uh, Director Karen Wells provided an update on suitability and stated that uh, MG&E and, and partner George Carney were previously found suitable. Um, and that they continue to find it suitable. And then it goes into the fact that Attorney uh, Donnelly uh, addressed infractions. I think it would be wise to point out that Director Wells brought those serious uh, infractions that were pending in Illinois to our attention, which then um, caused Attorney Donnelly to respond. So just a one sentence that, res that talks about the fact that uh, Director Wells brought those to our attention during the suitability um, discussion. And we can add that. We'll make that change. Great. Okay, subject of that amendment, um, I uh, uh, re remove for the approval of the minutes. Second. Motion's been made and second. All those in uh, favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it uh, unanimously. Okay, second item on the agenda we have uh, Ombudsman uh, Siemba, I believe. Um, to, um, yes, Ombudsman Siemba. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, today we have two quarterly reports uh, for Wynn Boston Harbor and for Plain Ridge Park. Uh, these quarterly reports are for the first quarter that ended March 31st, uh, 2016. Uh, the quarterly reports are somewhat a little bit later than anticipated uh, due to the flurry of activity we had during the first uh, two quarters of this year. Uh, we're working on an effort to try to uh, schedule these um, uh, many months uh, ahead, and we'll be working with the licensees about making them a little bit more regular and scheduled. Uh, but with that, uh, I introduce Bob DeSalvio, President of Wynn Boston Harbor, Jackie Crum, Wynn Senior Vice President and General Counsel, and Chris Gordon, Wynn Boston Harbor, President of Design and Development, to give uh, Wynn Boston Harbor's quarterly report. Thanks, John, and uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present again today. And before I uh, turn this over to Chris to give you the full run through on where we are from permitting and construction, um, I did want to take the opportunity to thank both the Commission and the staff for the work that went into the Section 61 findings and the ultimate uh, vote that you took. Um, we know and certainly respect how much work went into that because in a sense what you guys had was the culmination and consolidation of all of the other findings into one comprehensive report. It's pretty impressive when you went back, you know, when we got the final signed version, you go back and you look through it, it really reflects a, a major commitment on behalf of us, the licensee, but certainly a lot of work that went into and uh, I just would be remiss without uh, saying thanks to you and in particular the staff for uh, the amount of work that they put into that. Um, we're here today to report really very good news on our progress and where we stand. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to um, take you through where we are from construction, design, development, permitting. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're starting on slide. There we go. Uh, oh, there you go. Sorry. Uh, we're starting on page four with the permitting. These are under the state permits, and we won't go through each and every one, but as you know, the MEPA certificate was issued. The Section 61 finding has been posted, and as Bob said, that was a Herculean effort, which we appreciate. So that work, we think, is, is done. Um, chapter 91, as you know, there's a hearing on June 2nd for that appeal process, which Jackie is, is, is working very hard on that. So that is our big issue right now, is the Chapter 91 hearing. Um, water quality certification, that's been received. The mass contingency plan, the phase one, you'll hear in a minute about that, that uh, remediation, but that is complete. 
Um, the CZM permit, uh, that will happen right after the Chapter 91 because they're consecutive, but the work is done. It's just going to be issued after the Chapter 91. Historic Commission, Underwater Archaeology are all done. So um, the issue with the state permitting is just now Chapter 91. Mm -hmm. um, the local permitting, I, I'm sorry, federal permitting, FAA, those issues, those permits have been issued. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that will come right after Chapter 90, 91 as well because they're consecutive, but that's in very good shape. And also that doesn't affect the land side work. It affects the water side work. So in any event, it's not anywhere near our critical path. Um, and then the NIPTES permit, of course, those are ongoing as part of our construction management plan. So those are in good shape. Uh, the local permitting, uh, we continue to work with the City of Boston on some of the off-site roadway work. You'll hear about, about that in a minute, but those meetings are going very well. We've developed a good relationship with Boston's traffic department on the, uh, the off-site roadway work. Site plan review, uh, that was approved by the City of Everett. Uh, we keep them up to date on a weekly basis. We meet with them every week. Uh, we have other approvals. It says here the, the access road was just approved on May 5th. We now are going before them on the 13th for the McDonald's relocation. So there's a good, there's a good rhythm of work with the planning board, and we've, we're certainly in a good position with them. Um, order of conditions from the Wetlands Commission was issued, uh, and our first building permit was issued May 2nd. So we have the building permits we need now to get going uh, once we get some of the other issues resolved. Chris, um, so the site plan review, uh, is that the overall site plan, or is yes. that only pertaining to what you mentioned, McDonald's? No, the, the, the site plan was done in several stages. The main resort is done. Uh -huh. So the, the resort itself is done. We now have several follow-ons. We did the service road as a separate site plan review, and that was approved a couple weeks ago, so that's now done. Right. We're going to be following up with the walkway, the DCR connector walkway. For a small piece of work, it's complicated because there's different landowners and that sort of stuff. So that'll go sometime this summer or fall. We'll work on that. And then as, as part of the service road, there's the re McDonald's relocation. We filed that. We had our first hearing this Monday night. We'll have our second hearing May 13th. And so far, we haven't heard any concerns on that. So mm -hmm. we're working through those. But the resort itself is, is approved. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Uh, site remediation, as you know, the big piece of that was what we call phase one. Those are the removal of the three hot spots. That's done. Uh, the last truck has left the site. The paperwork's being buttoned up, and there's no more work to be done. Um, it finished up on schedule, on budget, and uh, we're not aware of any big issues. So we're happy about that. The site now becomes a lot easier to work with. Now those three hotspots are done. It's, a, it's more of a routine industrial site, sort of typical uh, issues to deal with, nothing unusual. So we're, we're quite happy about that. Uh, on the design, the design team is far, far along. The garage and foundation, those designs have been submitted to the city of Everett. Um, the actual foundation was granted a building permit. Um, they're now reviewing the garage. They're also reviewing the tower. We've submitted the tower for review. Uh, they've got a company called Four Leaf that's working with them. They're going th through their review process. And then in mid-July, we're going to submit the podium, which is the, the entire horizontal component of the resort, which is where, frankly, it's the most complicated part of the building. That's submitted in July. And then the site work and maritime work will be submitted roughly in July or August as well. So the design is, is well past the, the, the three-quarter stage headed toward finish, uh, final design. Um, the VE we've been doing has all been incorporated, so the, dr the new drawings coming out will incorporate all the refinements we made, the, which are all quite, uh, quite minor, so uh, we think we're in good shape on design. Um, you've seen the model, but this is a photograph of the model, uh, which is in our office now and has been very helpful, not just as a pretty picture, but people actually understand the project. When they see the model, we walk them around it, we show it to them. It's been a very effective tool in getting folks that don't do this every day to really sort of understand how the place uh, is designed. Um, Offsite infrastructure, as you know, we have a very large offsite infrastructure program that has to be finished before we open. Um, we have two design teams working on it. We have AECOM doing everything except Sullivan Square, and then we have Howard Stein Hudson doing Sullivan Square. Um, AECOM is fully engaged in the offsite work. There's a thing called a roadway safety audit that you have to do for each major intersection. Um, these are complicated because you have to invite all the local authorities, police departments, fire departments, city, state, you know, highway department. We finished all those now, and they went very well. Uh, very good cooperation. They had good suggestions. I mean, the state police are there, the local police are there, and they know the history of some of these intersections, and they know the, frankly, the accident records and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, it was great. And we, they made some tweaks to signage and to lighting and to timing. Nothing major, but good, very good uh, uh, work. So now those all have to get incorporated into the final design. So we're now taking those roadway safety audits and factoring that into the final design, which is uh, which is good. They're at about 25 percent design on most of those roads, which is the most important milestone because it really lays out uh, how it's going to work. So now we start the review process with the highway department, DCR, um, uh, the cities and towns that are involved in those. Okay. Sullivan Square, same thing. We're at about, we're almost at 25 percent design. As you know, that took a bit of a pause during some of the Boston discussions, but now we're very much back on track. We meet with the Boston Traffic Department quite regularly. 
Um, we're submitting material. They're reviewing it. We're getting good feedback. Uh, so we're, we're catching up on that, and we're in pretty good shape on Sullivan Square design because we want to get that done uh, in the midterm <laughs> as well. And then as you see the last bullet, the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group, which was uh, the subject of quite a bit of discussion early on, that is up and running and functioning. Um, we attend. Bob is a regular member of that, and it's, you know, it's doing its thing. So they're just getting going, but it's, it, it looks like it's going to be a, a pretty functional group, which is good. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, Mr. Gordon, you yeah. said that the Sullivan Square plans are, are, are moving forward. Aren't they subject to, to some extent, the uh, regional group that's um, ongoing now? We, we don't see a, I mean, of course we want to make sure they both are, in, are, are consistent, but we don't see a link between the regional group running its course and getting approval on the interim mitigation. So the mitigation plan is about $11 million worth of work in Sullivan Square. Now it is, the mitigation work is subject to the full-blown um, uh, uh, PIC process in Boston. So it will go through hearings, it will go through process, but we're, our understanding is it does not have to wait what could be a multi-year regional study to finalize and get going on doing the interim improvements. Yeah, the, the, remember there's a short-term solution and a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. And when when um, when uh, the wind uh, uh, people talk about uh, the Howard Stein design at 25 percent, the 11 million figure, that's what we term the short-term solution. What m had to happen as part of the MEPA process, the long-term solution is in parallel track um, what, mm -hmm. what's, also, what's also referred to as the regional working group where that, that we're also observers of that uh, group that has uh, its own track if you will uh, and um, mm -hmm. and that's a very important effort mm -hmm. but it's a, but it's in parallel mm -hmm. and, and just to clarify uh, the so-called short-term mitigation that we that we are proposing and we will be implementing prior to opening will all tie back into the uh, long-term solution, whatever that may be. So most of it's been designed. There are two different competing designs, and there may be more, but it's been designed to tie into that so it won't be wasted. Absolutely. So what's the, the nutshell um, of the uh, uh, mitigation improvements to Sullivan Square that's going forward now? Sure. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a collection of things, and we can, we'd be happy to, to brief you on the plan. For example, it rebuilds Spice Street and D Street, which is part of Sullivan Square. It rebuilds Cambridge Street, which is where you come off the ramp and you go down uh, to the circle. Mm -hmm. It adds a signal at the intersection of, of Spice and Cambridge Street. It rebuilds the access and exit to the MBTA station. Um, it it re-signals the whole area, including in some cases new hardware, but it really ties it into a unified system. It runs almost a mile of cable back to the Boston Transportation Center so they can actually remotely control the signals. Right now they're uh, not coordinated with everything else. So for example, if there's a Celtics game and they want traffic to flow through there, they at the command center in most intersections in Boston they can just make adjustments if they see something on the camera. They can't do that in Sullivan Square. So we're going to be running the cables for that so they get that hooked up. And then there's a lot of what we would call sort of smaller stuff, moving curbing, signage, uh, uh, some striping, that sort of stuff. So the bulk of it is rebuilding of those several intersections, which is a fairly major amount of work, and then running this cable all the way back to make this a smarter intersection from a, a central command point of view. We're also looking, not part of this, but separately, the city's also very interested in running cables under the river over onto Alfred Street and big chore, but it looks like there may be some spare capacity as part of the new bridge. So we're working with both the city of Everett and the city of Boston to try to link those signals as well because most of Boston and frankly some of the cities around it are, are coordinated from a, they're, they're, they're in a computer system that allows them to coordinate the signals. Sullivan Square is not and Alfred Street is not. So we're, BTD working with us is trying to figure out if they could connect all these uh, electronically. And I'm going to add one, one other point. We learned at some of the early meetings with the community that there were some improvements that needed to be made for pedestrians. So there were some areas out there that had no, almost no curbing, sidewalks, uh, better ADA access, and those kinds of things. So they'll all be incorporated in that uh, interim plan as well. And there's also a landscaping plan. It's pretty extensive. Right now the area is not uh, well kept. So part of this is to put, and, and we know it's interim because part of that gets removed when the permanent goes in, but we thought it was definitely, and, and the community asked for us to landscape some significant areas around the circle. Um, on the schedule, there's two versions. There's the look ahead, which I'll go through now, and then there's quite a few pages of detail, which I wasn't going to go through, but I'm happy to if there's questions. But on the big picture, looking down the road six months, obviously a big issue for us is the Chapter 91 hearing on the 2nd. Um, we're hoping that we get a ruling on that fairly quickly, and that allows us to really accelerate uh, everything that's going on on the site for construction. So that's our biggest issue. 
We talked about design. Uh, that's far along, going well. There's no big issues on design. Utility relocations have started. This is to relocate the utilities that, are, that go right through our site and to move them off to the side. Um, a lot of work, and it's fairly finicky work, so we're starting that now. It's fully permitted, and we're, we're working through that uh, as we speak. Um, Pre-construction activities, as you saw from your recent site tour, um, there's a lot of uh, pre-construction work going on. We're pre-excavating to check for obstructions. We're putting in some flowable fill in areas where we want to make sure the, the, the material is, is proper. Um, we're, you know, getting ready, mobilizing. The, the, the trailers are up. The gate is up now. The, the, the RFI tags went in this week. So we're getting ready so that everything's ready to move. Also, the service road has started. So the service road that goes all around the MBTA, that's underway as well. So there's a, there's a, a fair amount of pre-construction activity going on. Um, Off-site transportation, as we mentioned at this point, that's all designed. And then we're hoping, uh, depending on the uh, Chapter 91 resolution, that as soon as that's resolved, we will be starting right up uh, very quickly. Um, we've bid out the early packages. We have real subcontractors. They're under contract. They're ready to go. So once we get the green light, we'll be moving very quickly. Can I ask a question on that, sure. uh, Chris? So the, the, the hearing is scheduled for June 2nd. Correct. Um, but the determination will not come for well, 30 days maybe or what? The what? presiding officer has up to 45 days to issue a, a determination or a ruling on that. And okay. then it has to be signed off by the commissioner. Okay. Uh, so, you know, depending on her schedule, uh, we hope to get it a little bit sooner, but she yep. does have the full time. Right. Okay. Uh, behind that, there's a very detailed schedule. I'm happy to go through it if you want but, or if there's any questions, but it's sort of the nuts and bolts of, of um, how it would work. And I should say also that we're meeting now with your staff every week. And a lot of the details of this are subject to those meetings, which is a good way to keep uh, keep everybody on the same page as far as schedule goes. And mm -hmm. again, right now we don't, I don't want to say this will curse us, but other than the Chapter 91, we don't have any big schedule issues to talk about. It's sort of routine preparation work. Mm -hmm. no okay. um, unless there's detailed questions on the bar chart, let me go ahead to the end here. Uh, and Bob is going to talk to you about the workforce uh, and project diversity. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm picking up on uh, page 26, and to give you an update on the design phase, we're doing actually quite well on the design phase um, so far. As far as the uh, MBEs, uh, we have a goal of 7.9%, and when we look at where we are right now, which is about 8.3%, and what's in the pipeline, we're still expecting to come in around 10.7% on the MBEs for the design phase. Um, WBEs, the goal is 10%. We're at 4.1 now, but with what's in the pipeline, we think we'll get to about 7.2. So we are a little short on WBEs uh, and still working to see whatever we can do as we uh, get into the final phases of design. Uh, and we actually did extremely well on the veteran side. Uh, we had a goal of 1%, uh, but it looks like we'll come in about 6.6%. So when you blend it out overall for the entire design phase, um, right now on, and this is roughly about $50 million worth of work, um, we're looking at between what's already been contracted and what's in the pipeline. It looks like we'll come in about 24 and a half percent on a goal of 18.9. Uh, so we felt pretty good about mm -hmm. that, um, which is again I think very hard to do on the design front. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, kudos to the team that's been working on that. As far as the actual um, construction phase, Again, at this point, we've done mainly just the first phase of remediation and some early work, so the numbers are off the chart, and that's because um, Charter Contracting of Boston, which is a minority-owned firm, got the bulk of the phased one um, uh, remediation work. So right now, we're uh, uh, about 90% of the work, but of course, that, will, that number will obviously decrease as we get into the, the heavy lifting of the big, the big project. And on, on the, um, the women business enterprises, a uh, goal of 5.4%, and so far in the early work, about 4.7% uh, of the work so far. And on veterans businesses, a goal of 1% and 0.3%. So I think we're off to a pretty good start um, on the construction phase. And um, we were happy that um, we were able to work with Charter, which was great uh, to get an early start on this. Uh, and then under the, the women business zone, we wound up uh, connecting with a Everett security company that's doing site security that is a woman-owned business. And so that gave us a nice early push on that front as well. So um, we've been working aggressively with Suffolk on this. Um, they've beefed up. They added somebody on their team to work with us as part of the diversity program. And we know Suffolk will, will treat this very seriously as we start to go through the early packages uh, for the work on the site. 
Um, as far as the actual workforce for those that participated uh, in the early phase, here as well, I think we're doing uh, very well on the minority front, um, about fifth, goal of 15.3 percent. Uh, and right now, with total hours worked, we're at about 16.1 percent. And again, it's a relatively small numbers, uh, 17 workers uh, on that phase. Uh, for uh, women on the site, a goal of 6.9 percent, and right now we're about 7.3 percent. Uh, and for veterans, uh, there was a goal of 3 percent, we're about 8.9 percent. Uh, for that early phase on the remediation side. So again, we're off to a, a good start in that area as well. Uh, as far as the uh, community outreach goes, uh, beginning on page 30, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will highlight a couple of the events. We had a very active first quarter, as you'll see from this. Um, it started out with, uh, with uh, something Jenny and I did with the Center for Women in Business Enterprise. They had their event out in Lexington. Uh, we were involved with the uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Scholarship Breakfast in Everett. Um, uh, we've been reaching out to the Asian community in Boston through Chinatown Main Street and their gala, uh, the BSO, uh, and some other uh, trade and uh, business trade uh, meetings we went to. On page 31, um, I want to focus for a minute on the um, Massachusetts Girls in Trades Career Day. This, this event was um, uh, partly put on through the efforts of Jenny Peterson, who's on our team, along with the help of the trades. And uh, it was highly successful. They had about 400 young women who were involved in this uh, first outreach program. Mm -hmm. And now they're doing a, a follow-up on that as well. So it was a, a very successful meeting, uh, trying to get more women to get involved in the trades. Uh, a couple other Everett events we attended. Um, on page 32, we met again with the Hispanic American Institute. They came out to our offices for an update. Um, we had our phase two public hearing. Um, we're working with the Votex as well. Uh, and of course, the MassDOT uh, Section 61 public hearings. Um, on page 33, uh, Mr. Wynn was in town in March uh, to meet with some mayors and legislators and unveil the models. Um, we had a meeting that um, was the discussion at some previous commission meetings uh, with some residents from Charlestown to discuss lighting, and we thought that was a, actually a very helpful meeting. And result of that, we made some tweaks to the lighting package, uh, particularly around the, um, some comments on the podium level and, um, you know, toned down something that uh, was, uh, that we thought even might have been a little bit too bright. Uh, so that's all been incorporated. Chris is working on the final package, and then ultimately the final uh, lighting package will be submitted to the city of Everett, and then with a copy, I think, over to the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought that was helpful to get some residents. We brought them out to the office. We showed them the model, and then we had a, quite a long discussion about the lighting plan which is something that I know you guys asked us to take a look at. Right. What was their general reaction? Oh, good. They were happy that we were willing to listen and, uh, and make some uh, tweaks to the plan. Great. Great. Bob, some of these events, you know, um, they certainly demonstrate your, your, uh, your efforts to be a good corporate citizen, you know, in addition to the things you'll benefit from, you know, the Mass Girls in Trades Career Day, which we, we heard and read a lot about. Um, you know, going to a gala and things like that, do you find yourself having an opportunity to just network about the project, network about, you know, finding some of the businesses that could help you meet your diversity goals? I mean, it's good corporate citizen stuff. I'm trying to find out how you kind of leverage that for, you know, We find those goals. are, they're excellent opportunities. And uh, uh, the only mistake I made early on was not bringing enough business cards. And so we've learned early on, they kind of uh, gather around when they hear Wynn is in the room, especially anyone that uh, might be able to connect with us on the business side for doing work on the project. Also, what we find is, and, and hopefully we'll get away from this soon, most people don't think that we live here. And I say that kind of as a little bit of a joke, but it's, it's somewhat serious. I think a lot of people come up and say, oh, are you living in Las Vegas? And No, we have a whole team that's on the ground here. So I think the more and more that people learn that we've got a, a team of folks over in the office that we're part of the community, we don't just fly in for events, we're really here. Um, they're very pleased to know that there's residents of the local community at the events. And I think as more and more people learn that, uh, the better off we'll be. And plus having the model over in the office now gives us an opportunity to invite people out and come see what the project will look like and meet some of the folks. So that's been very helpful as well, just so that they know there's a local uh, team here. 
good. It also gives us an opportunity to speak with the residents in a more relaxed uh, surrounding. And uh, a lot of them are interested in the project and want to know what's going on. And it's, it's a good opportunity for us to update them on one on one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Great. And then the last, um, on the last page of the list of meetings on 34, um, we had the, uh, the public involvement process meeting again in Everett. Um, I did some, uh, I stopped over at LaSalle and they had a career day over there for some of their hospitality students. Um, Everett United, we've been continuing to make sure that we keep the local Everett home base group informed. They've been tremendous supporters and we want to make sure that we stay connected with them. They've been a, a vital part of our effort. And then Mayor DeMarie and I filmed a, um, a cable access show which was very, uh, got very good uh, marks from the community because what we're finding is even though we schedule these Everett uh, United meetings, but you have a tendency to reach a lot of the same people mm -hmm. that come. And what we found and what the mayor heard was that some people can't go, uh, trouble getting out of the house, they can't get babysitters. So somebody gave them the suggestion of doing something on cable access. So they, we filmed it in the office, we had the model there. They, then they ran it like crazy on their local cable access. And the mayor said he got very good feedback in City Hall as a way to reach more of the residents without having to ask them to come out to a meeting. So we think that was successful. And we, I think what we'll do is as the project develops, we'll probably do some more of them. Maybe even go out to the site at some point and do one live, uh, not live, but we'll tape it out on the site and then uh, put it out for the residents to see. So it's a good way to reach a lot more residents. You know, Bob, can I mention something? Because now you mentioned the model a couple of times. Um, I, I believe all of us went, had an opportunity to go out to your offices and, 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 and see the model and tour the site. And, and it's really quite something to appreciate it, you know, uh, close, at close um, uh, length and see it from the street view and, and, and see all the detail that goes around it. And I might add that it's two models. You have the one in the picture but another one um, right across the hallway there uh, that has the casino mm -hmm. with all its interior flow. Um, it's, it's really um, great that you have it in your office and that you're having people come and, and appreciate it uh, at close point. Yeah, and we have some more upcoming meetings scheduled where now the word's starting to get around. We're getting groups actually calling and say, can I have a, you know, we have a, a bank board meeting coming out in the near yeah. future. And so other businesses that Chamber of Commerce groups have now called and said, can we schedule a night where we bring our folks out? So we think, you know, I wasn't sure how this was all going to flow, but it's actually turning out to be, I think, a real advantage to have it there. Right. And it's right. pretty easy to get to since we're in station landing. <coughs> uh, works out very well. There's mass transit right there. Yep. It, it sounds like the more you educate people, the better they're accepting the project. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, Absolutely. Also, I do some presentations. We did one on the, to a real estate group last week, and they hadn't focused on it, which amazed me. They read the headlines, but now that we, we explained the project to them and told them it was real, they were, they were very pleased. And this is a group of 150 real estate brokers around the area that really hadn't paid that much attention to it. And a lot of uh, other things you've done. I also had the opportunity to see more renderings, as only mm -hmm. certain renderings make, the, make them into presentations and things like that. But the view that was very important for residents in Everett coming down Broadway. From the other the, side. From the other side, you often get you know the front view, which is what, mm -hmm. what most people are interested in. But there's uh, another perspective. Uh, it also starts to bring the project to, you know, more, to the it's mind. more real yeah. and brings it to life for the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, excuse um, me, uh, Chris, yes. is there any uh, indications of a <coughs> repercussion yet in the real estate market and the surrounding community? Uh, we hear folklore that prices have gone up in Everett. Um, we're not as clear on Medford Mald in some of those areas because they may be moving for other reasons. But um, we haven't seen new data yet for this year because it isn't available. But we are hearing that prices in Everett for various things, especially some of the industrial properties, moved up. Some of that's because of us. As you know, we've had to buy a couple properties around us, like the McDonald's. and the, So we've driven the market ourselves, and we're seeing that. So we'll see if it sustains itself, but we're seeing prices go up. We're also seeing uh, more interest. I mean, for example, right behind us is the apartment building, the Batchyard that was recently built, which has become very popular. They just opened it. They just broke ground on another hotel in Everett, which, frankly, it's been a long, long time since they've had hotels going up. So maybe it's not us. Maybe it's just the Boston economy, um, but it's moving. The other thing on the, the flip side is we did. We also got the new data this week that Boston they ranked as the most expensive construction in the country. So um, we're trying to uh, work through that. <laughs> 
Um, you know, let me let me add uh, something that uh, that is relevant to the point and the question you're asking, Commissioner. Um, I was uh, Chairman Crosby, Mark uh, Van der Linden, and I were at the um, annual meeting of the research uh, project that we have. Um, they, it, it was up in Amherst, and um, a big component of that is the economic uh, piece. Um, and one of the things that they're looking and tracking, because this is all uh, secondary data that's available, uh, are uh, housing and real estate prices. Uh, and, and we're getting nuance as in not just when the casino comes in prior to the casino, but prior to the announcement of uh, an award of a license. because. And we're going to see what what happens. What right. um, we're going to track it, uh, and we'll, we'll be able to to see how that goes at, uh, at the local and surrounding areas. Well, as, as, the, as the commissioners know, we've talked about it before. Our immediate real estate around us on Broadway, we track that, and we're, our estimate is that before we existed, until when we're done, it'll be between a two x and a three x multiplier. So we think that property will go up probably double, and some will go up threefold on on lower and upper Broadway, which is not unusual. I mean, it's been a a medium priced area when you put a five star resort across the street it's going to be uh, more expensive so mm -hmm. we, 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 the data isn't there yet but that's what we would expect to see mm -hmm. great and then i wanted to um end this segment with a couple of photos um this was the um this first photo is from the girls and trades event uh and uh, again this shows you the crowd they had a really good crowd uh and then the next um, the next Bob, photo were they high school kids yes yeah. Yeah. okay yes um, but there was some really strong interest in mm -hmm. this, which was great. And then the next is uh, Jenny um, with yeah. uh, some of the ladies that were in attendance. Um, and then the last photo is um, from when I, I was the keynote speaker for the Chelsea Chamber of Commerce, their annual uh, dinner mm -hmm. and meeting. Uh, and we went with Suffolk and uh, Rich Petty was there from the Carpenters. We had a nice group there. Uh, Hispanic American Institute was represented. Um, and it was good, good group Suffolk. And then I, we wanted to close with um, a video. This is actually a drone shot that was taken from what would be the equivalent of the top floor of our hotel. So we thought instead of you, having you go up on a lift 386 feet in the air, uh, it might be easier if we gave you a drone shot. <laughs> well, the, the question comes up all the time, what kind of a view do you get from Everett? And the answer is you get a spectacular view. And even, you know, even the foreground, the power plant, we think is it, it's all a good situation you can see Boston Harbor you can see the high rise you can see the river so 360 we think it's going to be a very nice uh, there's the unfortunately it's low tide yeah, yeah. And that's the yeah. tip of our um, retail Property. esplanade and the yes. outdoor mm -hmm. public areas that's assembly row mm -hmm. across the way the Couple Amelia birds Earhart flying dam. by. there's mm -hmm. the dam mm -hmm. and then you're now there's the gateway connector park mm -hmm. uh, and then you're now moving over towards the gateway center mm -hmm. and then looking back towards the rest of um, uh, Medford, the, the Medford, Medford and Malden. Yeah. Medford and Malden out that way. But look at the views mm -hmm. that you get from Great. the top there. It's pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Mm -hmm. We have a drone view now that they, they went floor by floor up and down the elevator. So you can, if somebody said, show me the 12th, and this stuff is very inexpensive. Show me the 12th floor. If Bob said, show, show me the 12th floor view, we can just show them the 12th floor view. <laughs> so it's very simple stuff. And we'll be doing this a lot during construction. Drones are cheap and easy. So you'll see this uh, on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, remind me the number of floors, Chris. Twenty-four. Right? Of, of yeah, in the hotel, yeah, in twenty-four, the hotel. and then of course we got three floors below that. We got the we've got the spa and the uh, right. the gaming floor. So right. mm -hmm. the whole building is about 386 feet high. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's Thank our you. update for this quarter, and uh, we're available for any questions you may have. No. Thank you for that update. Any questions from the? No, question? just you know. The, the diversity numbers look great. It, it, it's really apparent that you're paying attention to those issues and you're taking it seriously. So um, thank you for that. Sure. Looks uh, good. Yeah, no, uh, great update. Thank you. There's. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see. I was thinking when you give, were giving your update, um, the site plan review is all behind you um, in, in our other licensee. That was a big to-do for a number of reasons, and, and MGM, um, with the butters concerns and um, and you know some of the struggles over there don't translate into these ones, but it clearly is perhaps an example of all the work that you've done in the meantime uh, when you when you give these updates. So thank you. Well, it's also that. a comment on Everett. I mean, Everett is very supportive. Yes. Yeah. Meeting after meeting after meeting. There. I mean, they're rigorous. We don't get a free pass, but they're you know it's a very solid process uh, in Everett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uh, the quarterly report 
included in our package um, through the first three months talks about the project labor agreement. Yep. Can you forecast a little bit as to where you hope sure. to be by so the end of the second? PLA is signed and done. Good. So we've got the PLAs in place. Uh, the trades are totally on board. Uh, we, as, as I've said many times, we continue to fret about making sure there's enough workers. We need 4,000 workers, and we peak at about 2,200 all at one time on site. And everybody we've talked to said, no problem, but we don't want to take that for granted, so we're doing all the recruiting we can. We're trying to make the site easily accessible. We're trying to make sure there's food and there's bathrooms, because union construction workers today have a choice. So they can go downtown and work on a high rise, or they can go to Everett. And we want to make sure going to Everett's a good thing. I mean, they all want to work on the project because it's a fun, you know, glamorous right. project. But we want to make sure it's easy to get there. They get they've got access. So um, we're we've seen no issues so far. But we're going to continue for three years to be working closely with the trades to make sure we get enough workers. Because if the workers dry up, the work slows down. So that's mm -hmm. a big focus of ours. And in particular, we've been focusing on how the unions are going to recruit from the local communities, our host community, and our surrounding communities, as well as of course the diversity goals. Okay. In the, the early bidding, we've seen no shortage of subcontractors. Even though they're busy, they all want to work on this. So, you know, on the early slurry, excavation, facade, that stuff, we've had five, six, seven bidders. We've had competent bidders. We've had almost nobody that's been pushed out because of the lack of qualifications. The Gaming Commission will start to see them because they're all going to be, be, be notified of who they are. Um, we've been very pleased with the bidding pool. We've been uh, pleased with the prices. Um, and so, again, I think we're, we're in good shape. And the, and the labor issue, again, we, have, we see no problems, but we're going to stay on it because if we – if we run short of qualified workers, that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. We think that what we're hearing, too, there's a lot of pride in saying that you're working on this project mm -hmm. because of the high quality of the construction. And, you know, these are incredibly talented tradespeople that are in this region. And I think they just like sinking their teeth into something as complicated as this, but also as sophisticated. And it'll turn out to be a beautiful project that they'll be able to take their family and friends to and say, look, I, I had a hand in building this. Mm -hmm. And we hear that over and over again. It's one thing, you know, there's lots of really neat office buildings, but this is very, very different kind of a project. And I think pride is the, is the word that we're hearing loud and clear. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a, one question that came up during the site tour about some of the other properties. As you know, we're about to open a new property in China in the next few months. So we're taking part of my team and a big chunk of the Suffolk team are going to China in a couple of weeks, and we're going to kick the tires, walk the project, meet the contractors. We're going to meet the subcontractors, and we're not going to just hear the nice stories. We're going to try to make sure we understand exactly how the building was built and bring back lessons learned so that uh, we try to know as much as we can on this one. That's, yeah, it's, I, it's easy to believe what you just said, uh, Bob, because uh, I, you know, having, having been in construction myself yeah. uh, uh, at some, there, there's a lot that comes through, um, that's, there's a lot of uh, that culture in, in, in construction workers. They, they all feel like they had a hand or they, they, they built it themselves, and which is, which is true. Yeah. Um, um, this is, some of this is uh, the means and methods of the contractor, but sure. have you um, uh, hearing about or have an idea about uh, double shifts uh, uh, be, over it'll time? Be, it'll uh, be triple shifts. Uh, triple there'll, shifts. There'll be one main shift where the majority of the workers work. That's a regular daytime shift. There'll be a second shift that will still be construction work, but it'll be less. And then there'll be a third shift, which is mostly cleaning and stocking. So in the middle of the night, there'll be people out there restocking, you know, sheetrock and, and equipment and moving scaffolding, and they'll be doing all. So we'll probably have a couple of hundred people on the third shift, which is not as much. It's not construction per se. It's mostly cleaning, organizing, cleaning out dumpsters, restocking the job. And then the other two shifts will be where most of the work is done. And again, the main daytime shift is when by far the majority of the work will get done. Right. It's remarkable. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thank holiday. You very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Commissioners, I'd uh, like uh, Lance George, uh, Plain Ridge Park Be Vice President and General Manager, and Eli Heward, Purchasing Manager for Plain Ridge Park, to join us for their quarterly report. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome to our guests. Rise and cease. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. Little green button there. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> uh, I will move uh, quickly as I tend to do, so please feel free to stop me along the way. Uh, employment. Uh, no material changes from, uh, from previous updates in this area. Full-time, part-time mix uh, remains largely consistent, currently sitting at 67% to 33%, and the number of employees is at 522. 
Additional information on the composition of, uh, of the workforce can be seen on the following slide here. Uh, continued good news as it relates to diversity hiring. At the end of Q1, the property was at 18 percent, exceeding a goal of 10 percent. In addition, Massachusetts residents comprise 74 percent of Plain Ridge Park's workforce. The property continues to place a priority on diversity hiring and hiring in-state, and the results to date have certainly been encouraging. Though not part of the goal, additional detail has been added at the request of, uh, of both Jill and Commissioner Stebbins. You will see male-female percentages of 53 percent to 47 percent, mm -hmm. and the percentage of employees who are veterans at 3 percent. Mm -hmm. We're attempting to track down the, the number of individuals who are members of the National Guard. However, that, that is an optional field when employees right. fill out that box. Mm -hmm. Continuing on the topic of employment, a few numbers relating to promotions and transfers. Good news for employees in both cases. Uh, promotions, number of employees earning a promotion and taking on a larger role for the property, that number was at seven for Q1. And the number of internal transfers department to department uh, occurred for 16 individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, procurement, here we go. 63 percent of the eligible spend for Q1 was spent in Massachusetts. The remainder is split amongst several other states. Coordination between us, our purchasing team, along with the Commission staff, continues to yield positive results in this area. Mm -hmm. We're delighted with these numbers. We expect to see more of the same as we move forward here. Can I take a step back on yeah. the employment? Did you lose any employees? Uh, there's constantly uh, turnover, nothing unusual for us. Uh, high turnover areas tend to be in, uh, in the hospitality side. Mm -hmm. Cooks, mm -hmm. waiters, waitresses, hostesses, more of a transient job. Some are students. Some have it as part-time work. Any sense of a percentage? Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. We certainly have a goal. I would tell you that not uh, not unusual. What we see is the preponderance of turnover occurs within the first 90 days of employment. Mm -hmm. um, upwards of 75 percent of all of the turnover, of the 100 percent, occurs within the first 90 days of employment. On, on that note, uh, Lance, uh, what about your turnover? Have you, uh, over time, for overall, um, has it? Uh, been decreasing a little bit. I mean, there's there's an certainly there's a mm -hmm. I, yes. So Na uh, naturally, it, it it could be high. People expect certain things, and you know right. they they don't realize that standing up all day is not your cup of tea, maybe perhaps. Yeah, I think um, you know we talked about this uh, at opening. I think you know people have a perception of what it's like to work in the casino industry, right. and then uh, we certainly try to overemphasize the 24-hour nature of our business seven days a week, uh, holidays, and um, I think that people nod their head and say yes, but you know, it's a bit different mm -hmm. when you're there on, uh, on Christmas and Thanksgiving and un really understand and it really settles in. So right. we certainly see a lot of that. I think that goes back to the, the turnover within 90 days. I think the, the focus for us is ensuring that when we're out hiring and interviewing and recruiting, there's a better grasp and understanding of what the job is and what the job is, and the benefit mm -hmm. for us is to reduce turnover. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I, I th also think it's an interesting number. You're talking about internal transfers having 16 this first quarter of uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. That to me shows people get into the job, get into your industry, and at the same time, if they're not experiencing what they're doing at, the, at that time, they're looking to stay with the company and try to find another opportunity in a different area or what have you. So, I, yeah, that's a pretty important figure in the, in the, in the big scheme of things. Agree. I think, um, you know, people try to find the right fit, and, and sometimes that's us trying to work with them, and sometimes it, it's them raising their hand saying, hey, there's an opportunity over here. Can I apply for this opportunity? And to your point, they certainly want to stay with the company. Yeah. Can I ask a question about your spend by state? It's yeah. pretty specific to those other states. Do you have other properties there? Is that why it's that specific to Michigan, Pennsylvania, California, Illinois, or? So I'll defer to, to okay. Eli for this one. Yeah. So for this, uh, it is the t I chose the top spent top five or five okay. or six states by spend. So it's not no specific reason why. It's just that that's where our vendors are located. I see. So uh, it will change. Uh, I think. Uh, Q4 of, uh, of uh, 2015 was uh, a different mix of states involved. So it just depends on the percentage of uh, uh, spend in those particular states for those vendors selected. Okay. 
And then just in general, uh, that figure uh, no longer includes big purchases that you made at the beginning, for example, you know, slot machines and software and, and, and things like that. Correct. This is, this is more commodities. This is all type. operating. Operation, mm -hmm. yes. Yep. And I see we've left it open for category name, value, and percentage for Massachusetts. What you, so well, we, what kind you, of, we kind of assume that. But you did, you did, uh, <laughs> yes, you did Just want to keep your the update of 63%. Uh, digging a little bit deeper into the properties procurement for Q1 provided a breakdown of local spending. As a reminder, our host and surrounding communities are Plainville, Rentham, Foxboro, Mansfield, Attleboro, and North Attleboro. Uh, 61 of the local spend occurred with businesses in North Attleboro for Q1, followed by Mansfield at 25%, and then, uh, and then Foxboro at 9%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vendor diversity. Encouraging results. Uh, with that said, the property continues to pursue opportunities in each area. Across the board, Plain Ridge is at target or modestly below. Uh, this is particularly the case when those companies awaiting verification are included. No significant red flags to report, and the continued assistance by commission staff in this area is, uh, is greatly appreciated. When you talk about, Eli, you're talking about awaiting verification that's awaiting their certificate. You're doing business with them, but you're they're also on a parallel track going through a certification process. That's correct. Actually, um, there's a they're completing and uh, submitting the uh, the veteran business enterprise form supplied right. by the Gaming Commission. Right. Okay. Do do any of these awaiting verification mean the the licensing that we do? Their licensing is already in place. Okay. And they're moving forward. We're currently procuring goods from them. Okay. However, uh, they have not submitted their uh, veteran enterprise form yet. Got it. So it's a case of you really can't count them, but you're actively doing Correct. business with them. So we didn't have kind of chicken and an egg arrangement. Go get this, then we'll do business. With exactly. You. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, revenue taxes, revenue by month and a quarterly total has been provided, as well as a 2015 number. Positive results can be attributed to a, a variety of factors: uh, seasonality, improved awareness, marketing certainly come to mind all in for the quarter, combination of taxes paid to the Commonwealth and fees paid to the horsemen at 49 percent, total just under 19 million, with gaming revenues of just over 38.7 million. I'm sorry, just under 38.7. Successful quarter, net win per unit exceeding uh, $340 in March, climbing to over $350 in, uh, in April. So mm -hmm. good three, four months under our belt now. Can I? Uh, um Ask and emphasize that figure. Um, how does that? I, I know through our consultants that that win per unit always hovered nationally around 300. Mm -hmm. um, you you said 349. 340 in March and then over yeah. 350 in April. 350. Correct. How does that, in general, uh, uh, rank with other properties, other pen properties? That's a big number. Um, the the number for when you start to consider how much product you need on the floor at least in the pen world is about two hundred dollars win per unit yep. before you say i probably need more or before you determine that you can probably remove product um, this certainly places us number one uh, in the company by by a long shot mm -hmm. um, it's a big number 350 is one of the bigger mm -hmm. numbers uh, certainly the biggest number i've worked with yep yeah. mm -hmm. and what's what's at play here of course is the limit that you have because from a business standpoint if you started to see that number you start adding machines because it, it makes business sense. Is that, that is statement? exactly right. If, if in other markets, if it were uh, unlimited, we would certainly be adding product. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for my benefit as the new person here, yeah. uh, the win per unit, what, is that, what does that mean? Uh, win per, per slot machine, per gaming device, okay. per day. Per day. The standard metric that, uh, that people in our, our industry use. Okay. So that means that the, the amount just stating the obvious, I guess. It's the amount of, of, of winnings that comes out of a machine on the average per day. For the casino, the winnings for the casino. For the casino, Correct. on a net to the casino. Yeah, net, that's net. It's Correct. drop minus payouts. I got you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Compliance with, uh, with regulations. Good work by the team in the prevention of underage gaming. Uh, clean quarter, no underage gaming nor underage drinking occurring. Two individuals who made it onto the gaming floor were identified within minutes and escorted promptly from the facility. Mm -hmm. Coordination and cooperation between the property, commission agents, uh, the state police has been tremendous. Mm -hmm. uh, see no reason for that not to strengthen as, as time goes on and the property matures. Mm -hmm. Good work. Mm -hmm. 
just one more, one thing on the prevention. Uh, again, also in general, uh, you start you start to kind of notice trends, uh, so that you keep an eye on those trends, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you retain, you know, 30, 40 people, um, is it fair to say that you know you know what the usual times or might that be? Sure, not surprisingly, it's going to be yeah. weekend, uh, Friday nights, Saturday nights, when our volumes pick up as well. Yep. Um, nothing unusual. So that would include uh, underage. What is not included in those numbers are expired IDs, um, right. invalid IDs. That's specific to underage. But certainly on a Friday and Saturday night, you'll see some folks we have to turn away. Mm -hmm. As we get into the season when school's out, does this typically kind of uptick over the next three months? Yeah, I think we'll we'll see that in June and July. I also think that um, though there is a greater level of awareness, um, Twin River is 20 18. minutes down the road, 25, and they are 18 and over. Yep. So sometimes it's a, a genuine misunderstanding. Someone sometimes it's not, but there is some confusion with folks who are coming from Rhode Island. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Compliance point. with uh, with agreements, lottery sales. Significant up, uptick. Uh, quarterly results came in at 705,000, 47 percent increase over Q4. Mm -hmm. uh, the property and the lottery joined forces for a lottery ticket giveaway in February and March, which really helped drive that increase. A uh, great example of how the casinos and the lottery can work in a way that is mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Big number. Mm -hmm. No doubt. How does that work, Lance? Uh, the uh, at what at what part of the casino's operation is there the interface with the lottery people? So they visit us on a weekly basis. They are there to restock. Uh, they are there to address any technical concerns. Mm -hmm. um, they're PALs, I believe. Uh, I'm probably getting that wrong. But they have those units throughout the property. In addition, we have it in our retail store. Mm -hmm. I think they call them PATs. PATs. Player, PATs. Yeah, PATs. Got it. Player activated terminals. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just going to write that down for next time. <laughs> <laughs> Company overview. No issues or significant changes to the company. The company remains in a, a strong financial position. We added something a bit different this time. Charitable focus for us right now and for Penn is Relay for Life. Um, around the country, Penn has partnered with the American Cancer Society with a focus on Relay for Life. Not surprisingly, this has led to a variety of initiatives by all properties to raise money. Uh, externally, we partnered with Nesson. If you watched a Sox game on, on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday night, you will see and hear the Plainards Park donate $777 for every game the Sox win on winning Wednesdays. Uh, internally, jeans days for employees. If they donate $5, we'll let them wear jeans for the day. We had a chili cook-off. I think we had 50 entrants. Um, that's too much chili to sample in one day, just as an FYI. Um, <laughs> but the majority of, of donations are being driven by those employees who will uh, participate in the walk, and I believe the walk is on June 10th and June 11th. So the, the goal here, as for all the Penn properties, um, is, is to be the property who raises the most money, right? So there's a nice competition, friendly, not friendly, to, to raise the most money as the Penn property. Mm -hmm. That's great. Events and promotions for, uh, for Q1. Several marketing initiatives rolled out in Q1. Focus for us continues to be on growing the database through the Play 500 uh, on Us promotion. Mixed in throughout the quarter were several giveaways and promotions Calendar planning is always interesting in, uh, in Q1, given the unpredictable weather. Um, you know, you're at the mercy of, of Mother Nature, and so trying to strategize good days to, to have a large-scale promotion. Sometimes you win, sometimes you get a snowstorm of six inches, and, and nobody's there. And so that's always in the back of your mind when you're trying to strategize promotions. Mm -hmm. Q2, a lot going on. Uh, in April, we partnered with Bass Pro Shops for several giveaways. Uh, there is a car giveaway mixed in there, I think a motorcycle giveaway. Uh, racing season has kicked off for us uh, in April. We've enjoyed two legs of the Triple Crown. Both brought out uh, tremendous crowds. We're looking forward to the Belmont in a few weeks. And then finally, we are the official sponsor of the Plain Ridge Park Casino Fenway Concert Series. Uh, tremendous opportunity for us to drive continued awareness. Mm -hmm. I've set aside Kid Rock tickets for you. Um, <laughs> and you guys as well. Yeah, okay. Let the record show that's a joke. Fair enough. <laughs>
projects wrapping up here. Uh, play management's on track for next week, I believe May 31st. Should be in good shape. Uh, capital improvements occurring at the property. High definition video tote board was installed and turned on last week on the racing side. Mm -hmm. In addition, the racing paddock received an overhaul. Improvements made to flooring, to the stalls, to signage, as well as to the lounge. Yeah, if I can say I was out there and um, saw all the upgrades, it really is looking good. The paddock in particular, those uh, those mats were terrific. Good. Um, and and the, the board, I know there were some challenges, but it really does. Uh, looks good. It looks great and yeah. it really adds to the environment. So, and there were lots of people there, so yeah. it was uh, really good work. Good, thank you for that. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, you have a one-year anniversary uh, yeah. celebration. Anything, any details, or are you working that out? Working that um, out uh, for the employees. A uh, lot going on for the employees starting June 9th, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. Employee Olympics, so mm -hmm. a lot of, um, uh, lo uh, what do we have? Uh, cornhole, we have some races in mm -hmm. there. There'll be mm -hmm. horse races on the track. Um, so a mm -hmm. nice way for us to recognize all of the employees and the hard work that they've done mm -hmm. over the last year for us mm -hmm. uh, externally and to the customer. Some work being done there. We'll announce that in the coming weeks, but certainly there'll be some festivities uh, commemorating one year, um, almost, what, one month from today? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. It, it has gone very quickly. It is amazing how yeah, quickly it is. Amazing how it, mm -hmm. uh, when you're busy. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Any other questions? No, thank you. Excellent report. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. That concludes my report. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, very good. Um, do we need a break or should we continue? Nobody? Okay. Uh, let's, um, it's usually the chairman who likes to break Chairman's after one hour. Um, all right, let's go to the uh, administrative update but uh, by um, Executive Director Petrosian. Yep. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Pro Tem and members of the Commissioner. Uh, just a couple brief uh, updates, a couple of comments on the updates you heard. Um, I heard Mr. DeSalvio's comment that folks didn't realize that the WIN executives actually uh, live locally. I think we'll advise them to start working on more Red Sox paraphernalia. That will help <laughs> them. And for Mr. George's comment about the chili cook-off, yeah. um, I would just say while a pure chili cook-off is good, a chili and chocolate cook-off is very good. Oh. Uh, so they'll have to work on that. Um, for my substantive update, I will just uh, tell the commission that it is uh, getting towards the end of fiscal year. So uh, CFO Lennon and I are working on the FY17 budget. Um, I probably talked to a bunch of you individually about that process. The plan would be for us to come back to the commission after one more interaction with our licensees with a draft budget uh, during the first meeting of June for you to consider, uh, look at and consider before actually taking substantive action on the budget uh, during the second meeting in June so it would be in place for obviously the beginning of fiscal year 17. Mm -hmm. And then the last uh, comment is um, just in response to Mr. Chairman Pro Tem, your comment about going out to see the the um, the model at Win, of course, I'll just remind folks, of course, there was no quorum that went out there. You, yes. you as we always do, we do it in two by twos yep. and did a site visit. Um, so uh, with that, that is the end of my update. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda is the Racing Division, yeah. Dr. Lightbaum. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So well, I'll do a brief update on the thoroughbred end of uh, racing, and then after that we'll get into the standard breads. Uh, Suffolk has uh, put in their, uh, pers uh, their purse agreement, and so has the group that's working with Brockton. So both horsemen groups have agreements with the tracks that they're going to race at. Mm -hmm. um, Suffolk has put in a request for their racehorse development funds, and that'll uh, plan to be on the next agenda mm -hmm. for you all. Uh, and their racing office has contacted me regarding getting the applications for their racing officials and all. So we're moving forward on getting that going because, um, you know, that's beginning of July, so that will come up soon. Mm -hmm. um, with the Brockton license, um, there's legislation for to move uh, 30 days of racing for Middleborough. Um, right now they've uh, turned in their Brockton license, so there would only be 15 days of racing. 
So we're waiting to see what happens legislatively with that. Um, they are working, beginning work on the track already. Um, like I said, they've got a purse agreement and um, they're working on completing their application. That was one of the requirements that you put on them when they were granted the license. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, before the next meeting, we'll have that information in on them also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I saw the, um, the report, the positive report regarding Plain Ridge and their safety inspection and the other two um, potential racing, thoroughbred racing facilities are aware as well that they will need to have those completed. Yes, they are. Um, Alex, you mentioned uh, uh, briefly there's a purse agreement on both um, for uh, both Brockton, for Suffolk and, for Brockton Brockton and, and, yep. and Suffolk. The Brockton, is that only for the 15 day for the Brockton? Uh, I believe it covers the period of the 30 days and then if they okay. don't get it, you know, it'll, they'll reduce it. It'll be a joke, okay. Yeah. And you said you'd come back to us with actual uh, numbers Right, the they have to formally request it of, of the commission what monies they want out of that. What so, monies they want. Um, Suffolk has already put their request in, and um, I've notified Brockton that, you know, when the, they're ready, which should be probably before the next meeting also. Okay. Have that in. But we saw some figures when they first submitted their application. Didn't, didn't yeah, we? And the Suffolk figures were um, just like what they Ball had Park. asked for. Right, it's, it's yeah. in line with that, the 400000 a day, less money for the uh, horseman's group. And then they'll, sub they'll also, on top of that, have the money that goes for the mass bred stake races. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're figuring uh, to give out about $500,000 in purses a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll have recommendations when it's time to make those approvals. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. Okay. And um, now, I'll basically, for Plain Ridge, um, Doug's run some numbers, and so I'll let him go ahead and um, give you the numbers, and Steve O'Toole's here also to give you an update. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is the, the third annual report for the racing division. Oops. We're still on the update. On the, Did okay. you have some? Oh, okay, on the update. Okay. Before we get started on that. <laughs> Sorry. We're <laughs> jumping ahead for, of ourselves. Uh, 16 updates. Yes. For, yes. for uh, yeah. Okay. We, we have some good news regarding um, the handles thus far this year um, for mm -hmm. live racing at Plain Ridge. Um, year to date. We are at uh, 331,000 compared to last year, which was 236,000. So we're up about 28% uh, compared to last year. Is that a, to a cumulative figure or a per day? Uh, that's based on a cumulative figure. Yeah, okay. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's a nice increase that we had there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we don't have it for Suffolk. They haven't been running yet, but... Um, yeah. In terms of overall handles at the uh, at, at the four locations that we have, Plain Ridge um, has done approximately a little over 13 million compared to 8.5 million last year. So that's up 48 percent, which is a big jump for the same period. For, for the same period, yes. From, year over year. Yep, from January 1 through um, May 26th, compared to last year's uh, 15. So right. we're up considerably. Um, what was that percent again? 48 percent. Uh, Suffolk Downs, mm. they are at uh, 17 million this year compared to 11.7, so they're up 32 percent. Wonderland is at 1.8 million compared to 1.2, so they're up 34 percent. And Raynham is actually down. 9%, uh, 12 million this year compared to 13.2 uh, last year. And reason being for, for these numbers too, we had uh, the beginning of last year, there was an issue with the Monarch Group. Yes. There was a dispute. Okay. Um, Plain Ridge mm -hmm. and Suffolk and Wonderland are part of the Monarch Group and they were, were not receiving certain signals for a, a certain amount of time. So that kind of reduced our overall handle that coupled with the weather at the beginning of last year, too, was, uh, you know, they, they were closed down a few days. So, and Raynham's numbers were up because they're not part of that Monarch group, so they were receiving those handles. Right. So if we compare it to, say, the year before, are they comparable or is there some increase? Um, there's a little bit of an increase mm -hmm. for this year, this year from, from two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the trend, we, you know, we, ha we have gone up a little bit. 
good to but know. But it's a significant jump with um, with um, Plain Ridge and the ca casino being part of that. Mm -hmm. And Mr. O'Toole, are we attributing that to purses and an upgraded facility? For the lodge? Yes. <clears throat> For the, for the live, it's a combination of a couple of things. Um, purses are up, and it, it drew a lot of uh, new interest at the beginning of the season, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, days of the week. We, 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 we raced uh, Sundays last year, which tends to have a little bit of a lower handle because of, um, of the competition of simulcast signals. Mm -hmm. And so that day is, is out of the mix. But we've had, uh, for the month of April, uh, we had uh, pretty full fields, and that always uh, adds to a healthier handle at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you still racing Sundays? No, not this year. We were going yeah. uh, Monday, Tuesday, one, uh, Thursday, and then when we added the fourth day in May, we go. Uh, we add Fridays. Mm -hmm. And just to, just to um, uh, the, the question you asked about the overall simulcast handle to compare, uh, to compare apples to apples, um, the Kentucky Derby, uh, on Kentucky Derby Day, we were up 19%. It's probably more of an accurate um, barometer of, of, of comparisons. Mm -hmm. And um, for Preakness, we were up 15%. And that's about the trend that we've been experiencing over our overall handle, about about 15% up. It's a good number. We're, we're happy with it. All right, is that item, was that item A? Yes. Um, okay, well, that goes through um, item B. Could, uh, would it be all right if we went ahead and did item D next while Steve's up here on the Pentafecta totally request? Totally fine. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so, so I think Catherine's going to speak to that. So in, okay. in your packet today, you have a new section that we're going to add to um, 205 CMR6 that's on wagering. And the Pentafecta is a type of wager. It is when we adopted our wagering rules, we adopted, I think, almost all of the RCI wagering rules somehow. This one, for some reason, we didn't adopt. But this is a new product that both um, Plain Ridge and Suffolk will be able to offer, should they choose to. So what I'm asking the commission to do today is to vote on it and approve it on an emergency basis so they can use it right away. And then we will take it through the formal promulgation process. So, right. so I move that we. Um, that we approve the Pentafecta pools uh, as outlined in our packet. Um, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Any comments? I, uh, any, I, I just like the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great. Is there a tetrafecta, by the way? Because <laughs> I've heard a trifecta. Uh, no, this is this is great. It, it gives the. Uh, the, the, the licensees uh, an ability to offer more products that might help them, that would be uh, great. Mm -hmm. um, one quick question. Uh, when you offer the Pentafecta, do you need to tell uh, bettors kind of which option you're using for the distribution of winning? Yes, we have, we'll publish those. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. It will also, uh, and, excuse me, we'll, we'll also. Um, provide that to Alex and to the commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seems like that would be a very difficult um, pool to win. Yeah, the odds are very long. Five in the exact order? Yeah. That's the idea. The, um, <laughs> they, they put a twist on it at Gulfstream Park. Um, it's called the Super High Five. Mm -hmm. And pools get very big, and there is a lot of interest in it. But the kicker to that one is, um, you have to be the only ticket with the uh, for the carryover. Mm -hmm. So if there's multiple winners, then they share. And so those pools have grown to be uh, mm -hmm. pretty good size. Um, <coughs> I remember one last year was up around six hundred thousand wow. dollars for the for a winning wager. So wow. so they can hit it, but, but uh, on occasion it's it gets down to just one person hitting it. Right. Thank you. Thank Great. You. For the record, the eyes have it unanimously. Um, all right, thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you, thank you Steve. Thanks, Steve. All right, do you want to go back to um, item 5B then? Yes, we'll uh, talk about the end report now. Yep. Instead of going um, page by page through there, I'm just going to do some general observations for the past year, and then Doug will go through some of the financials. Uh, so last year was kind of the year of moving for the racing division. 
Uh, we moved out of Suffolk, we moved back into Suffolk. We moved out of our office at Plain Ridge so that that could be come part of the gaming floor um, into a trailer. And then once um, the white building got built, um, the racing building, we moved into there. And um, I just want to thank the IT staff here, um, Dan and John, uh, were very good about getting all of our needs hooked up at the different places again. So that was quite a mm -hmm. deal with all the different moves. Um, also, we um, worked with HR, IEB, um, and the legal staff as far as getting our um, seasonal employees on each year. Uh, we streamlined that process and made it so we can do it all kind of in one day, one-stop shopping. They can get their fingerprints done, get their ethics training, and all that. So I want to thank those groups for helping us with that. Mm -hmm. um, under the licensing division, we offered a few new things last year. Um, for this first time, we offered credit card payment, which was very popular. Um, Maria set that up for us from here. Um, we offered uh, two and three year licenses as well. In the past, we've always just offered a one year license, and that was be also became very popular. So at Plain Ridge, about a third of the people ended up picking that uh, choice. It made um, licensing this year a little easier because a lot of the people, all they had to do when they come in was pick up their badge. They had already paid for it the year before and all that. Um, it did change our um, figures in the licensing sections. You'll see some of that. Um, the um, number of licenses was down because of uh, Suffolk only running the three days, but our overall um, income from it was up because people were paying um, at Plain Ridge for a three-year license, so we got that money in. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's some, you know, differences there. Um, also, we started fingerprinting for the first time and worked with uh, Sergeant Somerville and his troopers. They were very, uh, it was a new program, so it was kind of a challenge to get it off the ground. Um, and we've tweaked it some and it worked very well. So we're doing that well. Um, the uh, auditing staff right now is, is Doug. <laughs> so Doug has a lot on his hands with that. As far as the veterinary department, we brought the blood gas uh, testing completely under commission control. Um, we ended up being able to hire a few of the veterinarians that had worked at Suffolk in the past, um, and they were well received. Um, our test barn coordinator, Chris Miller, did a great job in coordinating all these efforts. There's a lot going on in the test barn. She does a great job. Um, we also instituted a um, LASIKs program where we offered a 15-minute um, window um, where we wouldn't scratch the horse, but the trainers would be fined if they were late. And that enabled quite a few horses to be able to um, race when they otherwise would have been scratched. So that program also went very smoothly. Um, the judges and stewards did a great job um, in enforcing the regulations. And um, we worked very well with um, Steve and uh, Chip from the two different tracks. Had a lot of uh, good um, cooperation with getting our what we needed done through them and their staff. And um, as you all know, with the different hearings we had, um, there was a lot for the horsemen to deal with last year. Um, at Plain Ridge, there was the construction going on and things like that. Um, with Suffolk and um, the Brockton issues, the thoroughbred industry horsemen had a lot to deal with. So um, I'd just like to give my thanks to them for being so cooperative as we brought out some new programs and tried to work through the different issues that came up. I'd like to add um, and actually commend Dr. Lightbaum for her leadership. Um, I spent, you know, several hours out there last week and very professional environment. All of our employees are in really sharp golf shirts. Um, every day there are minor issues. I would say most of them are minor, but some of them are, are, are you know, are, are more than minor and quietly they get addressed, they get solved under Dr. Lightbaum's leadership. Um, Morale, tremendous morale with the staff. Um, the racing building, uh, signage, posters, it really looks professional. Turned out very That's nice, yeah. You working to get that done as well. I know you had help, but it really um, looks professional. The staff is extremely professional. We've implemented so many changes, um, you know, mm -hmm. outside labs, accredited labs, accredited mm -hmm. officials. Um, none of those were easy to, to just implement. People. Change is difficult, but I, I do credit you with um, continuing to educate folks. All of the RCI changes to medication, whatever it may be, it's a continual job, and I see that firsthand, and I just want to um, commend you for that. No, oh, thank you. We've got a great staff. Uh, Doug, will, oh, do you have any? Yeah, before, you know, I just want to build on that because uh, not only is it 
really the right thing uh, to do uh, for a number of reasons, but also for the business model for the for the product, the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. If you, if there is happy uh, people, happy regulators, you know, the product ultimately improves. Um, and um, although it would be very hard to try to assign it, uh, you know, to any any kind of results, increased purses, fields, um, or, or or handle, um, I know that all of that. Uh, eventually, has uh, uh, comes to fruition in, in those aspects, and, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's really good that that you're taking all these steps incrementally, like you've been doing. Thank you very much. Thanks. And now we'll let uh, Doug go over some of the financial figures from last year. All right. As Alex said, we'll we'll touch on the relevant points here, and if you can go to page 14, what we have here is just a kind of a stats of each of the. Uh, racing facilities that we have, and 14 is Suffolk Downs. And the big changes this year compared to last year were that, you know, Chapter 10 of the Acts of 2015, Section 59, allowed them to race from one to 50 days, where they were approved to race for three days in 2015 compared to 65 in 2014. So that will obviously change um, their numbers in terms of their, their starts, mm -hmm. purses, uh, for example, their purses this year for 2015 were $1,620,200 compared to last year's of $6,929,000. So that's a, a significant difference. I have a question on that. Um, the, the acts of 2015, it says here that um, they expire on July 31st. Um, but it says that uh, they were um, authorized to conduct simulcast for the entirety of any year. Does that, well, it's, or is it's, that really just for that year? It's for the years that the statute is in effect. That the statute? So, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. And if we go to uh, page 15, which has uh, Plain Ridge. Uh, they kind of went in the opposite direction. They raced uh, in 2015 105 days compared to 80 days the prior year. And you can see the footnote there, the uh, Mass General Laws, Chapter 23K, Section 24. And just for example also, their purses in 2014 were, were 2,581,000 compared to 2015, which were 4 million 210,636. So that's a significant difference as well. And on page 16, we show the, the uh, information on the two simulcast Greyhound facilities that we have. And below there, it'll, it, we make mention of the uh, Mass General Law Chapter 23K, Section 60, the Racehorse Development Fund. 2015 was the first year that we that we use those funds uh, to contribute to the purses. And it'll show the thoroughbred account and the harness accounts, what we're distributing. Where is that, Doug? Page 16, bottom down 16. the bottom. Um, now, so I had a question on that. Um, if the, let's just take Plain Ridge. If there was um, 3.9 million that, uh, uh, to purses that went that came the from the Horse Race Development Fund. Right. Um, why did it only increase a million to to 4.2 million that year? That am I yeah. reading that I think correctly? Is that the total amount? Yeah. I think that's the total amount that was distributed. So some of that also went to the breeders, and some of it went to the horsemen for um, welfare and. Uh, Insurance. So there's there's three so, different components right. to the racehorse development yes. fund, and that if that is the total number, which I believe it is, 80 percent of that only 80 percent of that number went to purses. Oh, then, and, and then and then 16 percent went to the breeders, and then four percent to the there's horsemen. They're split. Yeah, and and then also the split is 75 25 too. So it's the ho racehorse development fund is first split between the two types of racing, and then yeah. each split is split between the 80, 16, and 4. Right, right, I get all that. So mm -hmm. I, when I when I read the harness accounts, mm -hmm. that's that's already the result of the 25% split, right? 3.9 yes. million yes. Yes. for that year. Mm -hmm. Now that has to be split between the breeders and the, mm -hmm. 
and, 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 and all the rest. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but from that number, can I get to the increase directly, or are there other things that the Horse Race Development Fund substitutes in those persons yeah, well, between last year what and What we're going to do, we haven't done the um, purse uh, analysis for 2015 yet. That's probably what we're going to try to get done next week or the week after. And um, it'll be interesting to see from that, um, you know, we don't want to talk about numbers until we've gone through that okay. um, process. Um, we might want to come back maybe in August or something when we've finished a whole year of getting the money in from the um, casino. Okay. And um, we have the first uh, uh, agreement, fin the uh, review Analysis. finished. Right. And then we can um, talk about where the Racehorse Development Fund money actually went. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. And it depends. There's some of it's um, regarding the purse agreements, too, Well, that's as to what the total um, purse money in general, where that goes to. Well, I guess that's where I was going. The, it's yeah. the, the, the source to the purses is not limited to the Horse Race Development Fund because the Correct. operator includes... Right, part of the at Plain Ridge it includes the regular statutory things from the simulcast handle and the live handle and all. Right, yeah. right. Okay. You know, Doug, you gave some pretty compelling information kind of looking year to year. Um, I, I would just offer the suggestion that maybe when we do this report for next year to have the year to date from the previous year. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, you know, it's good you've gone back and shared that with us, but for somebody to be able to read the report, look at the different days, look at the different number of races, kind of year to date, I think would be interesting information. Yeah, you see that, that in a corporate annual report. We, we've always done an a calendar year comparison further right. in the report. We'll, we'll touch on that, but we haven't done a, you know, year to date. But we can certainly do that. Yeah, well, there's always a challenge that this is, we've been doing this on a calendar basis, and we have, on the other hand, our, mm -hmm. our fiscal year, yeah. right, right. and, uh, you know, but we should we'll yeah, so continue to Yeah, so there's always a carryover in terms of certain funds or what we do, right. because it's fiscal year compared right. to calendar year. But the, but the raising, there's a, no, a number of statutory directives from a calendar year perspective, uh, which is why right. we do a lot of this report on a, on a calendar basis. Okay. Um, which will bring us to uh, the racing division financials, which are, are based on a calendar year. And that's on page 27. So the, the um, revenue receipts for calendar year 2015 were a total of uh, 3,109,412 and 55 cents compared to last year's, which were um, three million two hundred and five nine sixty nine. This is a, a decrease of three percent from two thousand fourteen to two thousand fifteen. Uh, and with the expenditures, calendar year two thousand fifteen, it was one million seven hundred fifty three thousand seventy four dollars and seventy seven cents compared to fourteen, which was one million nine hundred thirty five thousand three hundred and forty six. And that was a decrease of 10%. So we reduced our expenses approximately 10%. Uh, can we just quickly outline what those decreases were? Well, we could, the biggest per percentage of that was the uh, employee compensation. Yes. That was reduced considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had our indirect charges came down from last year as well, mm -hmm. which are still, I mean, they're high. Just to let you know, this year the uh, indirect charges for racing alone is $186,144. Mm -hmm. And those um, employee, uh, those payroll uh, decreases have to do with the less number of live racing in Suffolk, doesn't it? In general? Yes, in that, general. that's a big part of it. And then we had the administrative. Uh, staff shift a little, shifted okay. a little bit too, right. so there were some changes there. And so this is only this is on the next page, but um, from the rece the difference between the receipts and the expenditures mm -hmm. um, is a little elusive because there's a big number that goes to other funds, right? Well, and you'll you'll see the additional program expenses on page 28. That's yeah. That's the unclaimed tickets that we pay out, but that, that, that's really a wash because we collect those monies mm -hmm. and th then we distribute those. And those are two years in arrears from 
So for the 2015 report here, those would be the 2013 outs. Yep. And also included in that is the local aid payments to so the local cities and towns. Which also have a direct reflection on, on the revenue piece. Yes. Right. Although this, this year, um, fiscal year 2016, yeah. um, we are not obligated to pay those local aids to the general fund. So this is the first year. So in essence, a comparison of next year, we will have uh, that $781,766. Yep. Okay, that'll basically be an increase of what is coming in for revenues to us because there right. will not be an outflow of that money. Okay. Question, uh, bottom of page 26, I think Dr. Leifam, if you have the answer, if not, you can get me information later. Um, I see the significant increase in fines, uh, in particular to 2014 from 13, and somewhat consistent in 15. Is that the regulatory reform, you know, we put in place all of the new RCI, every, is, is that a, a reason for that, or yeah, is the there something else yeah. there? The uh, judges have uh, really tried to um, get everybody, all the drivers, on the same page as far as the whipping regulations go. Yeah. Pine Ridge has one of the more so aggressive. We've, been, we've done a better job enforcing. Yes. And so they really did a lot of enforcement on that last yes. year. Um, some of it was the LASIKs program where yes. we instituted the fines for that. Mm -hmm. So that was where some of the the increase came from. Okay, and, and a significant decrease in suspensions last year. Do we? have an idea or do you need time to research that? Uh, I think um, there might be a slight increase in suspensions this year because one of the things uh, we found was that maybe people were um, paying the fines and then doing the same thing again. So <laughs> the judges and I, and, you know, we, we looked at that issue. Mm -hmm. um, if we find somebody for something, we're hoping that the whatever the fine is for, that behavior will end, you know. Um, and so this year they're being a little more aggressive. If somebody gets, um, and, and I don't want to say exactly what their program is, but it's something like if you've gotten fined once or twice for the same thing, there's a warning that the next time you're probably going to get a suspension. So progressive discipline. Exactly. We're, we're doing more progressive discipline this year mm -hmm. on that. But the decrease, is that because in 15? I think la last year they were just doing more fines I instead see. of suspensions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> on these financials, is there a reason that they're not presented um, in a year over year so that we can have the year before and the current year? Uh, we we, we can, for comparison yeah. reasons, we yeah. can certainly do that. Yeah. that. That would be very helpful. I was thinking that yeah. when you were um, verbally updating us on the on the on those figures, um, it's it's particularly helpful if you can see them side by side. Yeah, that was the point I was trying to make. Look at year to year because we've seen some right mm -hmm. improvement. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we move forward to page 32, that will give you a handle comparison, which we have always done um, from the prior year. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this shows the, um, again, the comparisons from 14 to 15, and we already touched on the, the, the uh, comparison from 2016 to, to 15. But as you can see in live racing, Plain Ridge uh, 2014 to 2015, we're up 13 percent. And uh, that has a lot to do with the additional days that we had. We had 80 days racing in 2014 compared to 105 in 2015. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Suffolk Downs, we know what that is. That was 65 days in 2014 compared to three days in 2015. Mm -hmm. So that's down significantly. Um, and if we go to the import, import simulcasting, as we mentioned, uh, the situation with the Monarch Group, yes. where Raynham is not part of that group, their, uh, their handle was up uh, approximately 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, Wonderland, their handle was down approximately 13%. Plain Ridge's handle from 2014 to 15 was down uh, about 10 percent, and Suffolk, including the ADWs, was down about 4 percent. 
which would give us a, a, a total comparison down from 2014 mm -hmm. to 15, down about 3%. And with the, the exports, um, Plain Ridge was up significantly because of the additional days. And again, with, with Suffolk, they were down significantly because of the only three racing days. Um, is it fair to say that uh, I think that's the most dramatic number, the, the increase on the export on Plainville, oh, Plain Ridge. Um, is it fair to say that in addition to the race days, that's also due to the purses and the product? Um, or is it hard to parse those out? Yeah, that, that I'm, I'm not sure of. It, um, I don't know if uh, Steve would be able to enlighten us on this if he was still if he's still here. Or not. He's here. But he's back there. It yeah. depends if he can or wants. So overall, I think it was I think it was positive, um, but there was a couple of uh, reasons why it, it was a big influx in handle in 2015 uh, versus 2014. Uh, the first one would be uh, we raced in 2014, we raced Saturdays and Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, and we did that to stay away from the construction uh, that right. was going on Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, there's probably about 60 or 70 racetracks that, uh, that are going. And uh, because of capacity, single signal capacity at other, at other uh, tracks and OTBs, um, we just get we get lost in the shuffle. Uh, you get even bumped. If, excuse me. You get bumped by the bigger uh, tracks. Well, well, we don't always get bumped, but there's just so much product to to be to yeah. be bet on, uh, and and uh, so and that's why we race Monday, uh, you know, weekdays at the time slot that we do because that we've we identified that a long time ago to be a niche for for our product. Um, years ago, it was called a bridge signal. Um, I, I think I think actually uh, at Foxboro originate, originated what was called the bridge bridge signal, where um, simulcasting had become uh, a, a new phenomenon, and uh, there was a way to carry um, the the signal from um, the afternoon the afternoon cards, the one o'clock cards, to the nighttime cards. So the four o'clock would uh, customers could come in at any time of day, and we were called that we, we used to be called that bridge signal, and then that became a popular. Uh, niche as well. So now there's actually three segments to simulcasting. You have your your daytime cards, your your twilight cards, and then your nighttime cards. So when we uh, made that change, um, our our export uh, suffered for that change. But we thought it was a necessary thing to do um, with the tra with the, the with the tra traffic for racing and uh, and the horses. And we had a lot of at one time we had some cranes hovering over the racetrack so uh, mm -hmm. you know we made a deal with Turner at the time that on Wednesdays they would knock off early bring their cranes down um, and then on the weekends we'd have to worry about it because they weren't um, you know they weren't working then mm -hmm. so that was uh, that was one significant um, change and then you know in 2015 uh, there was a lot of interest uh, we had renov we had the renovated uh, racing area and uh, we went back to our, our regular um, you know our, our regular pattern, and so and, and and export and live play off of each other. So the more the because it's all about pool growth, and so um, those are some of the reasons that 14 was so dramatically different than 15. But the racing was better in 15 than than 14 due to purse increases as well. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of different factors that went into it. But uh, we overall we were very happy. Thank you for that Thank you. explanation. Mm -hmm. All right. It, on page 33, it's, uh, um, again, a recap of the totals of uh, the handles and the variants, which is what we discussed on the prior page. On, on 34, it'll give you an analysis of purses paid, but this is for the prior year of 2014. Alex had uh, mentioned it earlier. We're still in the process of uh, getting financials from the racetracks in order to, to do our, our purse analysis for 2015. Mm -hmm. But just to give you an indication here, purses paid in 2014. I mean, if you want to look at the, the bottom of the page, it'll show for Plainridge 2,574,902. 
and the minimum statutory requirement, which is above that, which is 1,550,984, mm -hmm. uh, that means they paid an additional $900,788 to the purse, purse account. Mm -hmm. And with Suffolk, it was, it was the same there. Um, with their statutory minimum requirements for 2014, they paid an additional $857,315 to the purse accounts. Page 35, it'll be uh, suffix financials, which we had, um, we had gone over. They were down, again, from last year, approximately uh, total revenue, approximately 5%. Uh, and on page 36, it gives us an update of their cap fund, which we're in the process of trying to make some, some changes with. This has their projects through, this is through fiscal. Um, and right now, they have approximately $500,000 today in, in that cap fund, which they, are, they will be submitting a, a request for reimbursement on that. What is the negative in this page? Are you looking at 36, Doug? Page 36, yes. Uh, what is the negative 923 tell us? That's what's, um, that, that's through June 30, 2015 to finish that, the particular project of what's been submitted. Okay, since then they have taken, they have taken monies, out of, monies have increased and monies have been taken out of that since then. So they have put a request for consideration and request for reimbursement in there to get the, the projects done. So there is, this, this is almost like the project liability. As, as the capital fund gets funded, they'll pay them yes. themselves back. It, yes. We'll, they, pay, we'll pay them. It's their money. They will, they will put a project in for X amount of dollars. And as, right. the, as the money, in, they'll put that in. So we'll have to, you know, work down from that total amount. Right. And, you know, when money, sufficient funds are in there, they will put another request in right. to receive those and funds. And we'll, we'll sort of, we'll effectively reimburse it. Mm -hmm. but, but the 923 in negative means that's how much they have planned to do or have yeah. done? Yes, that's, they, they've put a request in. Yeah. And the monies have to, what's been issued to date, that's additional funds that have to be, that, that they will have to, put in in order for us to fulfill the obligation for that contract. So right. that'll pay that contract off. Okay. And the next page, 37, is their uh, promotional trust fund. They're actually closing out, you know, today we'll have to vote on it um, to close out the, the project that they have in existence now. <coughs> and after that is done, they'll have about $50,000 in their promotional trust fund. All right. Next to the Plainridge financials, which we had gone over, again, they were down um, overall from 2014, approximately 2%. And again, with them, the, the capital fund and the uh, promotional trust fund, they have been issuing uh, RFRs this year. And today, they have approximately $350,000 in their capital fund, and they have a minimal amount in their, in their promotional fund right now. And then the, the following pages touch on uh, Greyhound Racing uh, and the financials for Raynham Park, which as we know, last year they were up due to the uh, Monarch situation. Mm -hmm. Their revenues are up approximately 18%. And Wonderland uh, for 2015, financials that we had gone over, they were down approximately 11% for total revenue. That's good. Thank you for that. Um, any other, any questions for, um Dog or Alex, any no. other questions? Well done report. I know it's much upgraded from what it used to be, and I know every year you, you do a little more work. So very well done. Thank you. And we'd also like to thank Mike Sangalang because we have driven him nuts the past week mm -hmm. trying to 
put everything together, and he did a terrific job for us. Great. Thank you. There's no action needed, right? There's no vote on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for all your efforts. I yeah. have a typo that I'll let her tell you about. Okay. Have to do with my bio. <laughs> <laughs> with your bio? Yes. What's in your I, picture? I, I, came, I, it's, I put in the number in my bio when I came uh, uh, 17 years ago to New England, but what happens is, you know, when you put in a hard number, time passes. Time and then, passes you know, by. I got you. <laughs> it, it, should, it should say 1995, not, not 17 years ago. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that update. Uh, next item, um, is that conclude the report for the racing Please. division? Oh, no, we there's an item. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Let's go to item C uh, that does require a vote, the Suffolk Downs promotional fund request. Yes. And it, it, as we just discussed, the promotional fund, um, <laughs> this is a request for reimbursement from Suffolk Downs promotional trust fund, project number SPT 2010-1. Uh, the request for this reimbursement is $64,417.78, which will actually close out this project. Um, and to date, they have a project, they have a, it, it changes every day, but uh, $105,061.37 left in their fund. So we do need the commission's vote on this. And, it, and attached to this also is a letter from uh, Chip Tuttle, the COO at Suffolk Downs, requesting this money. And do we normally get um, invoices attached to this? I'm just trying we to do, remember. We do, but this project was taken out in 2010. Okay. So we have copies of all the paid invoices mm -hmm. from this particular project. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And they, ha they have three more projects in-house now that um, they have paid the receipts for, too. And those projects are ongoing, or? They, they've paid, they're, they're, they're done. done. We're just waiting to accumulate funds in the promotion so that we can funds so we can reimburse. reimburse them. Okay. All right, uh, any other questions or a motion? Mr. Chair, I'd move that uh, the commission approve the request for reimbursement uh, from the Suffolk Downs Promotional Trust Fund for the total of $64,417.78. Close out project SPT. 2010-1. Second. Motion's been made and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the ayes have it unanimously. That's uh, item C. There's another one here on the agenda for item D. Yeah, we, um, did we did that already. Mm -hmm. So is that concluded, Racing Division update? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Good thank work. You. All right, uh, the legal division is next, item C, Council Blue. In your packet today, you have a draft decision for the Region C evaluation, um, consistent with what we've done with our other decisions in other regions. The, there's no action required on this today. It is in draft form. We will um, ha give you the opportunity to review it, and in a couple weeks' time, we'll bring it back with any changes or, or comments that commissioners have. You should um, provide those comments to me or to um, Attorney Grossman, and we will incorporate them and then come back. Just to, to uh, remind folks, the decision that you made in Regency was effective as of the date of the vote. So it's in place and effective. This is just our written um, decision so that we can post it and we have a, a written decision out there. Our statute also does not require us to issue a written decision if it's a denial, but we have issued written decisions in every region since, so we are going to be consistent and do it in this one as well. So, you know, we just ask that you review it, um, let us know if you have comments or changes, and then we will bring it back to you probably in, a, in about two weeks um, for a final review and final approval. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we always, uh, as, as usual, it's a very thorough thoughtful mm -hmm. um, write-up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, is that uh, our next item on the agenda would be uh, 205 CMR slot machines uh, draft regulations. Um, John or Todd? Yeah, so um, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. So just about a year ago, um, with the assistance of our certified independent testing laboratories, um, we opened Plain Ridge Park Casino um, using the regulations that um, you have in front of you. And uh, in the interim, we have 
implemented a central management system and become a digital regulator. Um, and we have had discussions with um, both uh, our licensees and um, the industry about some changes to the regulations which would bring us more in line with standard practices, uh, would make the process simpler uh, to get uh, gaming uh, machines uh, into the Commonwealth uh, to, and I think, so we've, we are recommending here um, changes to the regulations to uh, effectively streamline them, uh, make them operationally more um, manageable, um, I think, and uh, easier for everybody to, uh, to work with. Um, in addition to that, we've uh, uh, made some of the language more consistent, uh, uh, calling out electronic gaming devices um, uh, where uh, we had previously uh, called them slot machines. And I think also we've defined what is it we want to take a look at when something changes to the configuration of a, of a slot machine? At what point does the Commission want to have uh, a role in uh, reviewing the certification provided by the lab and doing secondary testing related to uh, interoperability with our central management system, um, et cetera? So that's what these changes are. I don't, um, I, we, we're prepared to go through the details. And I don't know, Floyd, do you have anything to add? John pretty much summed up everything. We wanted to go with with uh, the opening of Clarence Park Casino last June and the completion of the CMS stand-up five months later. It's in an effort to follow industry standard, follow our, our actuals compared to our regulations. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. and, uh, and perhaps to also um, emphasize um, in following the protocol that we normally do, this is a presentation in draft. There is no action by, by us. Uh, today we'll review them, have questions. Uh, they're available for if people want to comment, but we can begin the actual promulgation process at a later time um, after we've I, had a I, chance to, to, to review them. Is that I actually there? believe that we want to begin the formal process and open it up to formal comment rather than informal comment today. Attorney Grossman. I, I, they're prepared to do that um, if, if that's the, the course. Um, it was suggested that these might not be tremendously controversial, okay. um, certainly mm -hmm. something that folks will want to comment on and have okay. a look at. Um, mm -hmm. So beginning the promulgation process would be appropriate. Well, let me, let me just say this. I might, um, we did not uh, notify in the agenda that there would be a vote. So I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, I that's correct. That. This is not for you to take action on today. You have not yeah. seen these amendments before. Yeah. So I think um, what would be appropriate is for the commissioners to review it. Yeah. And then we can bring it back and ask you to start the promul formal promulgation process. We can also put it out for informal comment if you think that's appropriate and you'd like to direct us to do that at this point. Um, but it, this, you have not had a chance to review these amendments yeah. yet. So. Yeah, well, we, they can be posted in the website as far as I'm concerned, like we normally do, but uh, let's hold off on taking an action and, uh, and continue with the protocol we've done uh, in the past. <coughs> Um, is, is there any reason not to um, invite informal comment at this point? None. Oh, no. no. No, we can certainly ask for informal comment. They are in the commission package, so they are available to the public right. now. We can post them separately, too, if you like. It's not a, not a problem. And oftentimes, the best informal comment we get uh, is from licensees mm -hmm. or interested um, mm -hmm. potential license uh, parties, you know, mm -hmm. agent, or you know, we, can, we can get that. Um, okay. Any other uh, any other questions? Any other reasons to um, talk in general about or in detail about any of these um, from the commission? I, I frankly think that the industry is going to be pleased with these changes because they are going to make it. Um, I think it's going to streamline the process of uh, getting new machines, new prototypes um, uh, in place and in play in the Commonwealth. Well, uh, well, whatever makes us uh, be a streamlined and, uh, and easy to do business, straightforward to do business with, I think it's, it's good for, yeah. for this commission in Massachusetts. So, um, okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give you comments as we see them. Does that conclude Section 6B? All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go to um, item seven on the agenda, Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, Director uh, Wells. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think Director. my mic is on here. 
Uh, on the agenda for your consideration this morning is the key gaming employee executive application for licensure submitted by Mr. Andrew Plant. Mr. Plant was hired by the Plain Ridge Park Casino as its director of security. The director of security is designated as a key gaming executive executive position. Mr. Blant, Plant has submitted all the required forms, responded to all of the IEB supplemental requests for information and documents. Investigators conducted the rigorous background check that is protocol for key executives in our licensed casinos. He was interviewed in person by the IEB state police and financial investigators. The investigation included an evaluation of Mr. Plant's integrity, honesty, good character, and reputation, and his financial stability, integrity, and background as required by law. Uh, Mr. Plant has a background in security. He's been working in the security field since 2006, working his way up the ladder. He is a Massachusetts native, and his position with the Plain Ridge Park Casino is the first time he has worked in a gaming environment. Mr. Plant has been working under a temporary license which is issued approximately 10 months ago. Mr. Plant is very enthusiastic about his position at PPC and has told investigators this is his dream job. Mr. Plant was open and candid with investigators in all aspects of the investigation. Initially, investigators raised some concerns about its ability and commitment to meeting past financial obligation, uh, the most concerning of which were incurred during his college years and included two civil judgments. These caused the IEB initially to deny the application. Mr. Plant subsequently took prompt, affirmative, and significant steps to remedy his prior financial obligations, and he demonstrated an earnest commitment to, to doing so. The investigators verified through document review and discussions with third parties that he had, in fact, addressed those issues. Mr. Plant has been working at PPC under a temporary license with conditions imposed by the IEB that facilitated our monitoring and our evaluation of his suitability for full licensure. No information or issues of concern have surfaced during this period. The IB has considered all of the information revealed during the investigation in the light most favorable to the applicant, a view which the IEB is required to take under 205 CMR 134.09. We also have weighed the policy objectives of Chapter 23K to ensure public confidence in the licensing process and the integrity of the licensing process, and also to provide new employment opportunities to our Massachusetts residents. I should also mention we're in close working relationship with PPC management who value Mr. Plant's contributions to the casino highly. And importantly, the IEB gaming agents and state and local police have had the opportunity to work with Mr. Plant over these past months and have found him to be professional and responsive in all regards. Taking into account the entirety of the investigation, it's the IEB's opinion that Mr. Plan has demonstrated rehabilitation and has demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable for approval as a key gaming executive employee. Uh, therefore, the IEB recommending Mr. Plant for licensure. As with all licensees, suitability is ongoing in nature and the IEB will continue its monitoring and enforcement role in this regard. Mm -hmm. So this is a matter up for a vote for the commission. The commission and our current regulations approves the key examining, key gaming executive licenses. Mm -hmm. um, Director Wells, you mentioned uh, concerns by the, um, uh, the investigative team, members of the IEB, um, mainly concerning Mr. Plant's uh, uh, issues that he had in college during those college years. Um, I think I know as one commissioner I share those concerns in, in reading this report, but did have an opportunity um, to speak at length um, about the report and uh, about the work done by IEB. And I know as one commissioner I am convinced that IEB did a very thorough job in reviewing and considering all the issues of concern and um, had the opportunity to evaluate his, um, his um, let me say his maturity moving forward and his acknowledgement of those past financial obligations. So I am uh, convinced or in agreement with the IEB's recommendation for approval here. I, I agree. Um, had the chance to also talk to the IEB about this case. I'm, I'm assuming Director Wells, that especially in key gaming executive positions where issues start to percolate up during the investigation, that we're always in kind of direct communication with our licensees as to how an investigation is going, issues that might pop up so that Correct. 
they're aware of it as well, and obviously Correct. they're mindful of the ongoing suitability, especially of this level. Correct. I mean, there there are some privacy concerns when you do an investigation mm -hmm. on an employee. You can't there's certain you can't disclose certain things to uh, to others. But um, it, it was interesting. PPC was very committed to um, keeping Andrew Plant uh, uh, at, and keeping his position open, and uh, spoke very favorably with him and. and and genuinely supported his candidacy for this license. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other comments, uh, Commissioner? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. I agree with the recommendation. I, I think um, a big takeaway for, for me is the evolution that you describe uh, in, your, um, in your report, not just in your remarks today, um, in terms of not just your evolution, but the applicant's evolution. Uh, in, in, in thinking about um, corrective action, the totality of factors. There's a number of factors, in my opinion, here that are really important. Um, they come across in your verbal, verbal update, you know, the fact that this is the dream job for Mr. Plant. It's what he wants to do. Um, it's the, the, the casino is really behind uh, uh, the, the employer. Uh, thinks they're doing a, a, a good job. Uh, so. Um, as part of my learning, my own learning in all of this, uh, there is never a black and white. There is shades of gray in all of this, but uh, I ultimately agree with your recommendation, and and I think uh, uh, it's it's a it's a good overall outcome. So so I move that we uh, approve Mr. Andrew Plant for licensure as a key gaming employee. Second. Motion's been made and second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Thank you. All right. Um, does that conclude? Is there any other business? Um, I do not believe so. Uh, okay. Is there a motion? Move uh, to, to adjourn. adjourn. Is there a okay. second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>